When she was asked recently what in the Constitution entitled the House of Representatives to adopt legislation directing all of us to specified um, physicians or making decisions for us about what kind of insurance we'd have and so on, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, responded by laughing and saying, you must be kidding. To her, the idea that the Constitution put any limitation on the power of the federal government to prescribe various kinds of behavior for you or various kinds of medical treatment for you was literally laughable. However, we shouldn't get the idea that this is a phenomenon, the idea that the Constitution doesn't really mean anything, is a phenomenon that's confined solely to the U.S. Congress or even solely to the Democratic Party. Not too long ago, uh, the Deputy Assistant Attorney General, Mr. John Yu, was testifying in Congress and ultimately uh, the question was whether it was constitutionally permissible, even though the statutes said that it couldn't be done, for the President to wiretap millions of American citizens and use what was euphemistically being called enhanced interrogation techniques against America's enemies. And Mr. Yu said, well, of course, the President has the inherent authority to do these things regardless of what the statutes say. And at that point, one of the senators asked Mr. Yu, who again was the Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the United States, well, suppose that the U.S. military should capture the son of one of the leading Al-Qaeda terrorists and decide that the way to get information from his father was by torturing this boy. Would the president have inherent authority despite the statutes to do that? Mr. Yu said, well, certainly. And then the next question was, well, suppose that the military decided that the, the technique that needed to be used was to crush this young man's testicles. Would the president have inherent authority to do that? And Mr. Yu's response was, well, it would depend what his reason was for thinking that was necessary. The point is that both parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and all three branches of the federal government have become used to the idea that although they have to take an oath to uphold the Constitution when they come into office, the Constitution doesn't actually tell them anything about what they're allowed to do. And in fact, they can do whatever they dub necessary uh, moment by moment. And you get people like Mr. Yu who has since returned to an, a position as a professor at a very elite law school in California um, making this kind of courtier's argument in support of unlimited government authority. This, I put it to you, this idea is the opposite of constitutional government. Constitutional government is government in which the people who hold particular positions have the extent of their authority outlined for them when they come into office. And those are the only things they're allowed to do. Now, I say to you that it's a bipartisan phenomenon, the idea that the Constitution doesn't actually define the limits of anybody's authority in the federal government. And I would ask you, in order to get you to agree with me about that, to conduct a thought experiment. Let's cast our minds back 18 months to the presidential election campaign between Senator McCain and Senator Obama. Each of them made many, many different proposals for ways they would like to spend our money and tell us what to do. And can you imagine a program that either one of them could have proposed <clears throat> that he would have thought he had to preface by saying, well, the Constitution doesn't currently permit the federal government to do this, but I think we need to amend the Constitution so we can do it. Can you imagine McCain saying that? Can you imagine Obama saying that? You can't imagine anybody in Washington saying that. And this is a sea change from the way the Constitution originally was intended to work. In fact, it's not so long ago that people in federal politics believe that the Constitution actually did prescribe the limits on their authority. So at the beginning of the 20th century, for example, there came to fruition a long-standing political movement in, in many of the states, which was called Prohibition. Prohibition's goal was to ban the production and distribution of alcoholic beverages. And when it had become the majority position of most of the states, ultimately people who were leaders in the prohibition movement decided, well, we should have this be a federal policy. 
Did they think they could make it a federal policy by passing a statute? No, they didn't. And why didn't they? Because the Constitution did not say Congress may ban sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages. And so before they got to the business of doing that, what they did was they called for a constitutional amendment banning sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages. And my point is not that prohibition was a good idea. Of course it wasn't. My point is that it used to be, not very long ago, um, that people agreed that Congress could only do the things that the Constitution said it could do. In other words, Nancy Pelosi's idea that, well, of course, we're Congress, we can order you to do literally anything we want, um, was completely the opposite of the way people understood the Constitution. So later on in the 20th century, when the federal government decided they wanted to ban sale and distribution of, of marijuana and hashish, cocaine, heroin, did they think they needed to amend the Constitution to do that? What had happened between the Prohibition Amendment at the beginning of the 20th century and our own day was, well, uh, the title of my last book is Who Killed the Constitution? It was the death of the idea of constitutional government. People had literally given up on the notion that Congress could only do a few things. Now you might think, well, that's not really the death of constitutional government. After all, the Constitution does other things. You know, it says that the president gets a four-year term and he can't have more than two of them. And it says that senators get six-year terms. Well, yes, of course, these are, that's true. The Constitution does create the structure of the central government. But, of course, the people who invented the idea of written constitutions were Americans and they were coming away from a situation in which the British had a chief executive and they had an upper house of their legislature, but they didn't have a written document saying how those people would get their offices or how long they would serve or how often there'd be elections. You don't need a written document to do that. The reason Americans invented written constitutions was precisely and only to limit what people in office could do. That's the only reason to have a written constitution. And I put it to you again that whether you're talking about John Yoo in the Bush administration or Nancy Pelosi, the Democrat who's now at the head of the Speaker of the House of Representatives, maybe the only thing they agree about is that the Constitution doesn't limit their power. Okay? This is a very bad thing. And you might think, again, while well, we lived with it for a long time, is it really that bad a thing? My answer is, well, yes. And this was central. The idea of limiting authority of these people was central in the experiment of written constitutions. Um,